tonight on the final play. Doucher back to the mound. Throw way high. Wow. LSU started the College World Series with a troubling loss to TCU. Now the Tigers must regroup to battle their way out of the loser's bracket. Um, I should have been better than that and made that play. Uh, it's definitely my fault. We've got more reaction from Omaha and analysis from CWS champion and current UNO interim head coach Blake Dean in studio. Plus, the Times speaker Yoon and NOLA.com columnist Jeff Duncan is in to talk about the home stretch of the Saints offseason and whether or not horse racing's rebirth is just getting out of the gates. The final play starts right now. On Fox 8 Sports, this is the final play with John Bazan. Brought to you by your Southern Quality Ford dealers and Oceana Grill. Welcome into our Sunday fun day. You know the drill. We call it the final play tonight. We go deep into the Saints final week of OTAs and look ahead to mini camp next week. In the state of horse racing, did American Pharaoh wake a sleeping giant? But we begin with the College World Series where the momentum of flying through regionals and super regionals came to a screeching halt today for LSU. The Tigers look like a completely different team against TCU and now must battle their way through the losers bracket to stay alive. Lutcher native Jared Poche getting the start over Alex Lang. Fourth inning, Jones hits one right back to the mound. Poche would nonchalantly throw it to first. Bad toss. Jones makes it all the way to third on the throwing error. Horn Frogs make Poche pay. Connor Wayne Hannon with the single over second base. Jones scores. TCU on the board first, one to nothing. TCU still threatening. Dane. Stainhagen back up the middle for a single runner scores 2-0 TCU 2-1 top five bases loaded for TCU a routine grounder to Connor Hale gets away cannot get the runner out errors just killing the Tigers 3-1 the score TCU in the lead things get worse for LSU as Poche goes fastball in big mistake hits the batter another run comes in 4-1 TCU in the lead. The bleeding doesn't stop for LSU. Wayne Hayden with the shot to right field. Two more runs would score for the Horn Frogs, and that would end Poche's day. The Tigers fall 10-3. Very disappointing. Here is Chad Sabaty from Omaha. On college baseball's biggest stage, the LSU Tigers played one of their worst games of the year. A season high four errors, five issued walks, three hit batters, and a pair of wild pitches all led to an ugly College World Series opener. Just really kind of a, just a totally bad game for us. I, I don't know how else to describe it. We really didn't do anything very well today. You know, it was it was just a total collapse for us. We didn't bring our best game today, and you know, like, and picked a bad time to do it. Starting pitcher Jared Poche was sharp early through three innings, striking out the side in the first and facing the minimum, heading into the fourth, but then things quickly unraveled. Back-to-back -back throwing errors by Poche gave TCU a golden opportunity to score, and the Horned Frogs capitalized, jumping out to a 2-0 lead. The momentum definitely shifted their way. Um, you know, I, I should have been better than that and made that play. Uh, it's definitely my fault. But um, you know, after that first one, um, you know, I, I tried to flush it. I didn't let the first one uh, impact the second one. And, um, you know, it was just two two plays that I should have made, and um, you know, it's, that's my fault. You know, we just had a couple of misplays there, and a couple of they got a couple of clutch hits, um, and things just kind of spiraled out of control for us there. The Tigers looked like they would score first, but TCU's Cody Jones gunned down Jared Foster at the plate to end the third. While LSU did break through with Andrew Stevenson's RBI ground out an inning later, the Tigers were unable to sustain any rallies against TCU ace Preston Morrison, twice stranding a runner on third base. He located his pitches and threw strikes, and he didn't give a, he didn't make many mistakes. And when he did, we had a tough time capitalizing on him. I mean, he's the winningest pitcher in TCU history uh, for a reason. He's a competitor, and uh, he got a lot of weak contact. Um, he, he lived off the barrel towards the end of the bat, and um, we didn't get him up in the zone enough today. The Morrison kid was, was making a lot of good pitches and pitching the way he can, and uh, he let us get ourselves out a lot. And uh, unfortunately, the score became, you know, kind of one-sided there and, and kind of took the wind out of our sails. 
TCU continued to make LSU pay for its mistakes. In the fifth inning, Poche loaded the bases. And an error on third baseman Connor Hale and a hit batter put the Horned Frogs up 4-1. to one. That lead would balloon all the way up to as many as nine runs in the seventh. The Tigers finally snapped an 0 for 13 hitless streak with Jared Foster's solo home run in the eighth. LSU continued to battle, but it was too little, too late. We can all agree that uh, no one played their best game. So, I mean, you can't blame that on anyone. You know, even when we're down, we still fall. We still try to battle back and get some runs on the board today. And, uh, you know, we just, you know, didn't bring it. And um, we've done this all year. I mean, we've lost games before, uh, but we're not hanging our heads. We bounce back from them. And here to help us break down the Tigers' effort today, a guy that knows a thing or two about Omaha and LSU baseball, UNO interim head coach Blake Dean. And Blake, as you're watching this game, as you're watching it unfold, where was the turning point? Uh, I think it was, uh, you know, uh, the, the momentum shift for me was when they threw Foster out at home, mm -hmm. and then they came in and, you know, had a, a couple just dinkers back to Poche, and he didn't make the play, and everything kind of snowballed on him a little bit, and it kind of got out of control for him. Experience, venue, all working in LSU's favor, and yet they commit the most errors they've had really all season long. Do you think nerves or jitters set in? Are you surprised that, that they may have set in, given that this is kind of a veteran team? I, I'm very surprised. Obviously, those guys have been together for three years. Most of them have you know, been starters for quite a long time now. Um, but again, it's a whole different ball game when you get out there in Omaha. It's still you know, the first game. They're trying to relax, get into their, to their, their game and the motion in which they play in. And it, it didn't go their way. And it, it showed. The score showed that result. Had there not been the throwing error by Jared Poche, does he have, how long do you think he lasts and, and does he have a better outing had it not been for the errors? Oh, no, no doubt, no yeah. doubt. I mean, I think if he'd had those, you know, ground ball out one, then he had another ground ball out two, then who knows, maybe he goes six, seven innings. You know, it's the other pitcher did well. He kept him, you know, kept LSU off balance, but there's no telling. It could have been a completely different ball game. Was it the right move to start Poche? Um, again, I won't. I won't contradict Coach Maneri's move, but you know, my, if, if it was me, I probably would have thrown Lang. I think he's game one's the most important game. I know he was trying to match the lefty lefties up, but uh, Lang is your guy. He's been your horse all year, so I would have came out of the stable with him to start it off. Six runs in the last three games in Omaha in the new stadium. This is a very potent lineup. Uh, no real weaknesses. What do you make of their hitting struggles the last three games they've been in this ballpark? Uh, it's tough, and the ballpark plays it plays big. Uh, the key is is you got to make the plays and you got to pitch well. TCU pitched well. They made the plays. That's why they won the game. It's, it's only going to be a hit here and there. It's who runs the bases better, who plays defense better, who pitches better. Hitting is not you know a big a big factor in the new park. All right, Blake, you stick around for a few more minutes. We have more Tiger talk with you a bit later in the show. Coming up next on the final play, three weeks of Saints OTAs are now history. So who stood out? Who needs work? And who is banged up? We'll break it all down with Jeff Duncan of NOAA.com and the Times Picayune. You're watching the final play. More depth is coming to the Saints defensive line. The Saints signed defensive tackle Kevin Williams this week. Williams is 35, played 12 seasons in the NFL and has made six Pro Bowls for his career. He's had 63 sacks and 68 passes defense spent last year with Seattle. Well, it's football in June. It can make heroes out of some, complete phonies out of others. The bottom line is there are no pads, there's minimal contact, so excitement should always be tempered this time of year. However, the building blocks for training camp are formed now, and this week, the Saints took another step forward. There you go, drive, drive. And just like that, OTAs are now done for the Saints. And in their ninth one this week, the two-minute drill was featured. The competition cranked up. Ultimately, you have to practice with a purpose. You have to, when you get in those situations, it's something that when we've been good here as a team, we've been pretty good in the two minute in the fourth quarter. And when we've struggled, uh, you know, we haven't been as good. And you, each year, you look at about five, six, seven games that come down to that, that final drive. And, you know, so you, you do have to have a sense of urgency and the guys are competing. So that, that's, that's something that uh, is important. Speaking of competing, Delvin Bro did exactly that. Coming from the CFL, Bro has wasted no time in turning heads. He had an interception and four pass breakups on Wednesday. The mental element of it, uh, he's handled pretty well. He's in real good shape. You can see that now. And 
continue to work on the fundamentals and uh, but he, he's handled he's handled things the installation all of that uh, really well so that's encouraging he made some plays today the week also marked the first full team workout of first round pick Andres Pete Pete completed his school commitment and was on the field running with the second team at right tackle he's able to be at the rookie camp which he was um, we're able to have communications and with the technology now go through the installs he's, he's coming from a, a pro system um, I, I think there'll be some catching up to do uh, uh, and yet at the same time I, I think knowing him uh, he's a pretty sharp guy he just graduated from Stanford so I'm sure he's had other challenges that are probably a little bit more difficult than that um, so but these next three or four days will be important for him next week and, and then up into training camp. Ten players did not participate for one reason or another. Cam Jordan was excused for the birth of his child. Akeem Hicks, Marcus Colston, and Brandon Browner were all nursing minor injuries. Junior Gallette was injured as well. In fact, Coach Sean Payton confirmed what had been reported. Gallette is out with a pec injury and still waiting on what to do next. Right now, he's working through and, and we're waiting on, and he's waiting on a final opinion. He, he's got a pec in. He's got a pec injury, and just wanting to make sure we're wanting to make sure we get the the right opinions on on the direction we're going to go. Um, I'll leave it at that. Here to help us break down OTA number nine is Jeff Duncan of NOLA.com and the Times Picking Union. Okay, Jeff. First off, June football. How do you view June football? Well, it's hard to get too excited. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the time of year when optimism abounds. Uh, everybody's undefeated. So I tend to temper my enthusiasm mm -hmm. a little bit this time of year. The players aren't even in full pads. It's very hard to evaluate. And the players themselves are going through these organized team activities. And it's basically built for the newcomers mm -hmm. to get the, get the knowledge and the installation of the offense and defense. So I really try to wait until the fall training camp before I really start zeroing in on players moving up and down depth charts. Speaking of newcomer, though, it was to me it was impossible to ignore Delvin Bro. Four pass breakups, an interception. Um, also, he was first first team behind Brandon Browner. I mean. Is he a contender right now for a roster spot? I don't think there's any doubt about it. And I was like you. I went out there expecting very little mm -hmm. from Delvin Bro and was very impressed with him. The thing I liked most about him was his confidence. You mm -hmm. can see it. He, mm -hmm. he exudes it on the field. He belongs out there. And that's, that's saying something for a guy that's coming in from the CFL, very limited experience. Uh, and made plays right away and also the way his teammates talk about him. Mm -hmm. Veteran guys like Keenan Lewis already talking talking this kid up. I think it's a good sign. And we forget he was a five-star guy coming right. out of high school. This guy really can play. Okay, other side of the ball, wide receiver behind Marcus Colston and Brandon Cooks really is anyone's guess. Who do you think emerges and do you think perhaps the Saints may have left themselves a little bit exposed at that position by not really addressing that position in the draft? Well, I think that they're missing one key aspect. Unless Joe Morgan can fill the deep threat role, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a, that's a position of need, that aspect of mm -hmm. a receiving core. I think Nick Toon's going to get the first shot there. Okay. You know, he, he, I thought, came on very well down the stretch. You go back and look at the stretch of games uh, to finish the season. He was very productive. He, he didn't have any huge games, mm -hmm. but showed enough, I think, for the Saints to put him maybe in that third role. But you said, I mean, this thing's wide open. Uh, Sean Payton alluded to this the other day. If right now, if you looked at Marcus Colston in his rookie year, he wouldn't even made the team. He was really <laughs> struggling to get the offense down at this time, and then he emerged mm -hmm. late in camp. I think we're going to see something like that happen again. Tight end position, you have Josh Hill, you have Ben Watson, then you have a lot of unknown uh, behind them, there's a report out that uh, uh, last week that Jermaine Gresham came in, took a visit uh, to New Orleans, 27 years old, pretty productive, pass-catching tight end. This is a no-brainer to me. I, I, if they can make the deal, I say make the deal for Jermaine Gresham. I agree 100%. I think they will. Mm -hmm. I, I, it sounds like it's just a matter of timing mm -hmm. for that to come to fruition, and I think it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're very vulnerable right there. I, thought, I think a lot of us thought they would take a tight end in the draft. Mm -hmm. They didn't. Josh Hill is... Obviously a, an exciting prospect, but very much unproven mm -hmm. as a starting playmaker in the league. And I think Ben Watson is here as kind of a stopgap. He even had said right. it in the locker room. This is his last year probably in the league. They need more depth and talent there. If they have an injury there, they're exposed. Jermaine Gresham makes sense. It could either be a draft pick or a free agent or undrafted guy. 
the newcomer you think will have the biggest impact on this team this year? Well, I don't think there's any doubt about it. C.J. Spiller is going to be the guy. Mm -hmm. You listen to Sean Payton talk about him. He sounds like a kid on Christmas. <laughs> All the things he's going to do with this guy. He made some great plays yesterday. You mm -hmm. can see his explosiveness. Uh, he's the you know the Reggie Bush, Darren Sproles, but he's got a little more size mm -hmm. than, than those guys have. And I think uh, him combined with Mark Ingram, who emerged last year, gives them maybe the best one-two punch they've had. You know, C.J. Spiller on that wheel route, that, that's yeah. a play you got to watch, and I, I'm with you. I, the, 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 the phrase man crush comes to mind when <laughs> Coach Payton talking about uh, C.J. Spiller. Okay, big picture. I know you're a guy, you kind of you look at the theme uh, of a team. What do you think the organizational tone was this offseason? I mean, was it competition? Is it back to character? What do you think the overall organizational theme was this year? Well, I think both those things you touched on were key, but they seem humbled to me. I think last year was a wake-up call for everyone in the organization, and I actually like the business-like approach mm -hmm. they're taking, not only from the coaching staff, but the players in the locker room. Uh, you don't hear a lot of boasting. Uh, they, I think, took their medicine a year ago. Yeah and they're going to hope to fly under the radar this year. This team's got talent, but you can't look at their roster and say they're any more talented than maybe Atlanta or Carolina. So I like their attitude so far. All right, Jeff Dominic, stick tight. Uh, you'll be back with us a bit later in the show. Still to come on the final play, back to Omaha we go, where Chad Sabaty goes one-on-one -on -one with LSU head coach, Paul Manier. Watching the final play. Tough start to the College World Series for LSU. They fall 10 3. The Tigers averaged eight and a half runs per game during their title run in 2009. Since then, have scored just six runs in three games at the CWS. With more on the Tigers, here's Chad Sabaty from Omaha. Joined now by Tiger coach Paul Maneri and coach definitely a disappointing start here to the Collins World Series. What's most frustrating just knowing that your talented team did not play its best ball? Well, yeah, that's that's disappointing and losing the game is obviously disappointing. You know, we had a lot of confidence going in and after three innings, it was really a great ball game. We had a clutch hit with two outs in the third inning. Unfortunately, you know, their outfielder made a tremendous play and threw our, our base runner out the plate and we thought we would have a lead. And then things just kind of happened in a negative way for us here in the top of the fourth inning. We fought back and made it two to one and had a chance to tie it. We couldn't quite tie it. And then, you know, the four run inning in the uh, fifth just kind of did us in. You know, it was kind of an insurmountable uh, situation for us at that point because, um, you know, you're going up against a really good pitcher. And, and uh, you know, in this ballpark where it's very difficult to hit home runs to get back in it. but. Like I said, uh, Chad, we're just going to regroup now and, and uh, you know, we've got to pick ourselves up by the bootstraps and get ready to play on Tuesday, get a win on Tuesday, and then we'll just keep moving forward from there. Your defense has been so solid all season long. To see the uncharacteristic errors, yeah. just how frustrating is that aspect of today's game? Yeah, well, that, you know, that's the one aspect of our team that I think we've been able to count on all year, and, and to, to make four errors today was just so uncharacteristic for us and, and it might have been a little bit of nerves it might have just been you know it could have been anything I don't know they're, they're young kids you know I mean they're not perfect they're 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 not robots they're doing their best and sometimes things don't go exactly as planned so again we'll just regroup moving forward you have an all-american freshman ace Alex Lang pitching on Tuesday I'm sure that brings a lot of confidence for you well, yeah, and that's why Alex is pitching on Tuesday. You know, we were hoping it was a winner's bracket game, but we knew also if we fell, you know, in a hole that, you know, he's the guy you want pitching for you. So I'm sure he's going to go out and compete hard for us. Coach, thanks and good luck. Okay, my pleasure. All right, Sean, let's go back to you in New Orleans. Welcome back in. Blake Dean, UNO baseball interim head coach, former LSU Tiger, has a ring as an LSU Tiger. Okay, but in 2008, you were in this scenario. You were uh, you lost your first game in North Carolina. You came back and you won that second game. What is the mood like after that first loss? Uh, it's, it's kind of a, a blow to your ego and to your team. I mean, obviously, the first game, as we know, is the most important. Mm. Um, so it's, you know, everyone's down. But again, you have to bounce back. You have to go out there because if you lose one more game, your season's over with. So you got to be able to turn the page really quick and move forward. What is the key to doing that? Um, it's just the preparation all year. I think LSU plays one of the toughest schedules and plays one of the mm -hmm. toughest environments in the country. So I think they're used to, uh, you know, facing adversity and moving forward. So I think they should be all right with it. You get into a game where the finality is there. You know your season is over. Is that the type of game where kind of the leaders rise up and hopefully lead your team to the right direction? 
Sure, sure. That's where you again your Bregmans, your Stevenson, Civics, all these guys that have been there for three years know it's you know it's now or never. If you lose, all those guys are moving on. Their their LSU careers are over. So they gotta step up, be leaders, and go out there and do what they gotta do. All right, he is Blake Dean, UNO interim head baseball coach and also former Tiger who has himself a ring as well. Still to come, Jeff Duncan is back to discuss whether or not horse racing is back. Will American Pharaoh's historic Triple Crown be the catalyst the sport needs? You're watching the final play. Jeff Duncan back with us here to wrap up the show with some horse racing talk where history was made. Jeff, viewing a Triple Crown, where does that rank on your list of you know, sports viewings, if you will? Well, Sean, look, as a, a Louisville native, Louisville, <laughs> Kentucky native who grew up around horse racing, uh, it was right up at the very top. I mean, obviously the Saints winning the Super Bowl mm -hmm. was the biggest sporting event I've covered. I've covered some Olympics, mm -hmm. uh, seen, you know, Michael Phelps win all those gold medals, Usain Bolt, but this was special for me as a Louisville native. Uh, I didn't think we'd see this again. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a whole generation of horse racing fans had never seen a Triple Crown happen. And I thought it was very special. And I think the way American Pharaoh did it, it was such a dominant race. Mm. And the celebration afterwards, that event uh, will always be special to me. How much did the actual sport of horse racing need something like this? I think it was critical. I mean, I mm. think uh, the sport has been well documented. It's mm. losing fans. Uh, it's in trouble, you know, as a business, I think, in America. It's really become more of a niche sport. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a sport from the turn of the century, mm. kind of like boxing. It's kind of mm -hmm. lost its luster, and it needed some kind of hero. And I think the way uh, American Pharaoh accomplished this certainly is a, a, you know, a bolt of fresh air for the for the industry. Speaking of American Pharaoh, what kind of legacy does American Pharaoh leave? Well, I mean, he's going to go down in history as one of the great uh, three-year-olds ever. Uh, his his time was the sixth fastest in Belmont history. His aggregate time of winning those Triple Crown races. Uh, is the fourth best of all the Triple Crown winners. He's only lost one race ever. Wow. And if he runs uh, one or two more times here and probably remains unbeaten, yeah, he's going to go down as one of the five to ten best three-year-old thoroughbreds of all time, and that's uh, saying something. Indeed it is. Talking Saints, talking horse racing. Jeff Duncan. Thank you, sir. Always fun, Sean. Right. Thanks. The Women's World Cup is back on Fox 8 this week, starting Monday with the world's top team, Germany, taking on Thailand. Tuesday night, the U.S., finishes group play against Nigeria in prime time and Wednesday afternoon Mexico and France square off. Our time is now up. Our thanks to Blake Dean and Jeff Duncan for stopping by and thank you for staying up late with us. For all of us here at Fox 8 Sports, I'm Sean Fazan and that's your final play. The final play was brought to you by Southern Quality Ford Dealers and Oceana Grill. Fox 8 is proudly locally owned.